It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker, Michael Berenbaum. I could, I don't know Michael as many, as long as some other people in this room do, but in the short time I know him, I just know that he is technically a legend. Um, and what does a scholar mean? Well, a scholar means that you will not forget the words that he will tell you tonight, and please remember and share the message you're gonna hear. When Michael was here seven years ago at FSU, I had laryngitis. So when I have laryngitis, I can't talk, so I need to listen. So I learned very well how to really pay attention, and I remembered everything he said that night. But then recently I found out that he has touched many, many people over the years. And I could go on and I could tell you how many books he's written, and the movies he's produced, and how he created and helped create the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and among many other things, and help many testimonies get put together from the Shoah Foundation. But I learned something else, that Michael became very important to, special, to some special people along the way. Um, last year, I attended the American, Associ the Association of Holocaust Organization Conference. And the president stood up and he said, when I was way, way back, when I was a teacher in Queens, I had a student in my middle school and he was a very smart kid and he's sitting here today. Then the next day, I'm sitting in this conference and another man stood up and he said, I'd like to say that I feel very proud that I was in the same high school as Michael Berenbaum. But I want to ask everybody here in this room tonight, who graduated from Florida State University, raise their hand. And I see Michael raised his hand too. <laughs> so now I did not continue when I was at this conference and I heard how this man went to high school and this man was in middle school. I could say now that we all went to the same school here. And Michael, <laughs> and I think that is really great. And Michael has received his PhD from Florida State University and so welcome back. We're so happy to have you back. And Michael also, is, it is great honor that he received in 1995 a very, very prestigious award, the grad made good. So that is very special and I know it means a lot to him. So I just wanted to recognize him for that. So with that, I'd like to invite him up here to speak to everybody. Thank you very much for a lovely introduction. Um, um, and Barbara add, add, added something. Uh, the last time I was introduced like that was yesterday where one of the students got up and said, in 1995, Michael Birnbaum um, was honored with the Grad Made Good Award, but I wasn't alive then. <laughs> <laughs> and if anything wants to make you feel uh, <laughs> Uh, and the other thing is, I'm always cognizant of exactly how long it was since I left Tallahassee because I left Tallahassee with uh, my oldest daughter being two weeks old. And um, we also had a very humorous thing which uh, Leon, uh, Tallahassee um, uh, um, Hospital will um, not forget which is that uh, we were students in Florence and we decided we were gonna have kids and we decided to get, um, uh, you know, child uh, uh, pregnancy and birth insurance. And the rule of that was it went into, um, it went into use on the 270th day. And, um, Little did they tell me, except in my early sex education courses, that if you make love to your wife, she could get pregnant that night. And then we were counting down whether we could enter the hospital at six in the evening, eight in the evening, <laughs> 10 in the evening, 12.01, or whether they had a provision that you started at five o'clock in the morning or something. And we called up about six times in the evening as the contractions were getting closer and closer to find out when we would qualify. <laughs> and when we finally checked in, the woman said, you have not, we have called the insurance company four times with these questions and you have qualified. 
and within an hour, my daughter was born. <laughs> I want to talk to you very seriously this evening. And I want to talk to you seriously this evening by picking on uh, uh, one more um, cute story. Many years ago, John Lindsay um, told a story about Arthur Goldberg, who was a wonderful justice but could talk on and on and on. And he said, last night I spent a month with Arthur Goldberg. <laughs> and I can say that I've been here about uh, 36 hours, but you should know that Barbara has had me working. This is about my fourth or fifth address. <laughs> and luckily, not all of you have attended each address, so I may repeat myself, but I can have the feeling that uh, yesterday I spent the month in Tallahassee, but in the good sense of the term. I'm asked sometimes what I would like to happen in the future of my career. And I'm going to tell it to you in a very simple way, which is I dreamed that I became irrelevant. And the reason I dream I became irrelevant because when we're creating the ending of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, if you had the perfect ending of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, you would have said this is the way 20th century humanity behaved. They saw the magnitude of evil that could occur. They became frightened of such evil and they began to discipline themselves in such a way that never again became a reality. If you ask how Yad Vashem should end, Yad Vashem should have been able to end in a world in which the Jews learned that landlessness and statelessness and powerlessness invites victimization. They came home, they became an integral part of the neighborhood in which they lived, and they were able to flourish and to thrive at peace with their neighbors in a world that appreciated the contribution that they could make to the region. The most serious thing we have to say about the world in which we live, and we are looking around here, we are a generation that experienced two of the greatest triumphs of 20th century humanity, which is we experienced the collapse of the Soviet Union without a bullet, and the opening of the Berlin Wall without a battle. We experienced the fall and the demise of the apartheid regime of South Africa without massive slaughter. And we experienced the collapse of communism and the birth in regions that did not know it of democracy. And we thought we had succeeded in creating a better world. And then we had the root awakening of what's happened to our world in the 21st century. And the irony of all is that the Holocaust has come to play a more important role not a less important role in 21st century humanity. I just spent a couple of weeks at West Point. Now, you could originally say West Point is about to establish a chair in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. But that's not a reason to celebrate, it's a reason to cry. Why? The U.S. Army believes, and they're not incorrect in their belief, and we have to, as Americans, be not pleased, but be respectful of that belief. They believe that the shape of warfare in the 21st century is going to be engagement in genocidal conflicts, and they want to learn about 20th century humanities and their genocidal conflicts to be able to, have to learn how to be effective in the 21st century. They have a realization of what our world has become. 
And as they have a realization of what our world becomes, they want to learn from the past to be prepared to engage what they seem the, seems likely they will have to face in the future. And nothing would be a greater joy than to be able to tell them that they are wrong. But none of us would have the courage to imagine that they are not wrong because of what we see on the horizon. And I've been asked to do something with you this evening, which is to talk a little bit about, and I wrote a book on this, the known, the unknown, uh, the, the re-examined, and the um, reconsidered. And I want to talk about four or five works that we have now in the field, which shape, very importantly, shape how an understanding of the past may contribute to a different understanding of the future and provide for us a warning. All of this is to underscore the importance of what you're doing. What you're doing by supporting uh, this institution, by supporting HERC, is to say that the lessons of the Holocaust have the capacity not only to tell us that this is a miserable, sad, and difficult world that our students can learn every day by watching national television and even sometimes local television, but to tell us that they have the capacity to instruct, to inform, to engage, to emotionally move, and hopefully to transform and teach values that I don't want to say can prevent, but at least can alleviate, engage, and raise the issue raised by the Holocaust. And therefore, you have, you have my gratitude for being partners in this very important effort. And you should feel um, that this is one of the causes that yields significant results in the classroom, in the engagement with students, in the way in which they learn and in the way in which they remember and recall. So I'm going to talk for a couple of moments about some scholarly contributions, but they're going to reflect the way in which these issues, the real way in which these issues are unfortunately all too prevalent today. Let me touch on a very important book just came out about a month and a half ago. It's by a Yale historian called Tim Snyder, and it's called The Black Years. And Snyder has been examining the region of the Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, and the Ukraine in particular for many years. And he, in fact, wrote an earlier book on the famine in the Ukraine that linked it and in many respects he spoke of the area as suffering with a double genocide. First, the genocide of the allocation of resources by the Soviet Union and then the genocide that was perpetrated by the Nazis and they were victimized twice. He raises an interesting hypothesis. He's wrong in a couple of issues but we don't have to deal with that. But his overall hypothesis is a very interesting one, and, and let me just add that. What made the Ukraine unique to undergo famine is that the Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. Think of the Ukraine in our terms as Iowa, and think of Iowans being unable to eat bread, wheat, corn. Inconceivable. If Iowa can't grow food, who can grow food? And if the Ukraine can't grow food, and they could grow food, but they couldn't allocate food, and for them to undergo famine is one of the most massive failures of states. Imaginable. And you have to understand that and understand that they were victimized twice. Now, what 
he builds on is the idea, and this is true of all, um, of almost all genocides, he builds on the idea that Hitler's vision of Lebensraum, of living space, was really a dream to replicate what the United States of America has, which is moving from sea to shining sea, and having within our borders and boundaries and natural contours the capacity to achieve plenty and food safety and resource safety. And we have to think of how blessed we are as a nation that within our borders and boundaries we have food safety and resource safety. And believe me, living in California now where uh, water is becoming very scarce, it is a pleasure to walk into a shower and to be able to stay there for three or four minutes and not feel guilty. And to understand the abundance of that, it's also lovely to see green as most of us are letting our lawns go yellow if we haven't put in cactus and other things. And that's not to speak of fires and all the other stuff. So his idea was that Hitler was essentially interested in living space in order to conquer the Ukraine and to create a world in which Germany was secure in regard to its food resources. And keep in the back of your mind that one of the questions you always have to ask over genocide is the question essentially of who's going to have land, who's going to have possessions, who's going to have the resources, and what the battle of those re for those resources are. And ironically, the scarcer those resources become, the fiercer the battle becomes. By the way, keep in the back of your mind, for those of you concerned about Israel, a piece of good news. Israel has essentially solved what seemed to be insoluble, which is, is, is its water problem. It solved it in two ways. It has 85% reuse of water. Compare that with the maximum in any state in the United States is 17%. And then it's also gotten desalinization down in such a way that not only did it engage in water, but it's now engaged in a deal with Jordan and indirectly and directly with the Palestinians to provide them with water. And because of that and the question of resources, the one thing you can be sure is the more linked Jordan and Israel are with water, the more impossible it is for them to what? Go to war with one another. He then has a second theory that is part of his explanation, which is very important to understand. And his second theory is that the Jews were in the greatest danger not when they had the apparatuses of states, but when you had a situation of the eradication of states. Now I want you to think of that because if you think of that as an issue, think of what's happening in Syria. Think of what's happening in the entire region of Iran, uh, of Iraq, and in the entire region of Kuwait and the entire region of Libya and the collapse of the nature and the structure of state, which leaves humanity in the war of all against all, and you resort not to a national identity, but to a tribal identity where the ties are the ties of blood. And in statelessness, you have the possibility, the real possibility in, in statelessness, of killing people with dramatic ease and the like. And he shows that how even in the transition of statelessness made the victims of double genocide also the participants in what he calls double collaboration. Meaning that they collaborated with the Soviet Union in the invasion from 1939 to 1941. And they collaborated again with Germany in 19. 
41 to 43, 44, and consequently they used their collaboration with Germany, with Nazi Germany, when it invaded to eradicate their collaboration with the Soviet Union, and they blamed it on the Jews. And consequently, he speaks about the radical nature of statelessness and presents an interesting argument where the state was not destroyed, the percentage of Jews in the population that were annihilated was extremely diminished in comparison, awful, terrible, miserable, diminished in comparison with the others. He then speaks of a third thing, which is the role of anti-Semitism. And he has a unique perspective, and uh, those of us in the field have known that anti-Semitism was raised as a central explanation by a man by the name of Daniel Jonah Goldhagen in a book called Hitler's Willing Executioners. But Snyder's take on anti-Semitism is very interesting. He said Hitler saw the world and we have to think about this for the nature of perpetrators today. Hitler saw the world essentially as a battle of nature in terms of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. And survival of the fittest means essentially that to those who have is given more and to those who have not, more is to be taken. And the reason why that was essential in Hitler's worldview, a worldview shared with a significant number, the reason that that was essential in Hitler's worldview is that one of the reasons he wanted to eliminate Jews was precisely because he saw in the morality, by the way, this would be not only in Jewish morality, but also in Christian morality, he saw that what? He saw that the coming to the aid of the poor, the underprivileged, the widow, the orphan, loving thy neighbor as thyself was the antithesis of what nature has in which the fit are the only ones who survive. So he regarded the Jews as profoundly dangerous precisely because they were impeding nature in the notion of the radical vision of social Darwinism that was to be there. Now that says something also about those who would be, who would be advocates for social Darwinism. I'm not, calling the, I'm not speaking of them as Nazis, I'm not speaking of them as annihilationists, as genocidal, but we're talking about something that is inherent in the idea that brings people to have not the exercise of power but the restraint on the exercise of power. Keep in the back of your mind, what's the genius of the American system? The genius of the American system, and I'm looking at a judge, is the separation of powers. Restraint on the power of government, the separation of powers so that what? The executive, the judiciary, and the legislature are not the same entity, and there are things that he can't do and there are things that he won't allow governors and legislatures to do, not only individuals. And the genius of our system is not only the exercise of power, but profound restraint on the exercise of power. And that becomes something very important. So the issue then becomes, what do these values show? And how do they reflect themselves in the modern world? And where do the greatest dangers come? And we're seeing right now the massive danger of the collapse of states. And if you look in the Middle East and if you look in North Africa, you're also seeing that the boundaries that were established by 19th and 20th century colonialism are not natural boundaries. And by the way, that triggers against the notion of globalism, where in one sense we don't know boundaries when we enter into the world of globalism. I have communications from four or five continents. I can speak all over the world. I can have my work 
seen and read instantaneously all over the world. I can see a ball kicked in Georgia and watch it, what, drop in Tallahassee. But I can also see it, what, I can also see that in Spain or in Portugal. I can see it in Europe. You have this instantaneous thing which means that the globalism that takes place knows no boundaries, while essentially we have the collapse of boundaries at the same time. Let's take a second book. And this book is a, a very interesting book. And I was asked today about what's happening in research in the field. The book is written by an Israeli expert on logistics. Now you've got to ask yourself, what the hell does logistics have to do with the Holocaust? And the answer in part is everything. And when a guy knows logistics, he tells you why it's essential. And by the way, if you, if you want to think of the modern world and want to talk about logistics, Let's take a very simple thing. What would Amazon be without FedEx and UPS? And what would Tallahassee be without the airport? And that's not a good airport. And betting on connections, I just want to give you a um, um, David's father was a graduate of Hebrew Union College, which was established in Cincinnati, which was the fastest growing city in America in 1840 because it bet on the Ohio Railroad. A very small city by the name of Chicago bet on the railroad, uh, it, it, it uh, bet on the Ohio River, and a very small city named Chicago bet on the railroad system. And you saw what happened to both cities over the course of the next century. And Chicago then built its airport in the way Atlanta built its airport. And all of a sudden, something happens with regard to logistics. His thesis was very simply, has vast implications for us. His thesis was very simply, he hypothesized on the basis of logistics that the German army would be at war with the SS for the use of trains. Because he's a logistics expert, he did the calculation. There were 600,000 horses used in the campaign against the German campaign against the Soviet Union. 600,000 horses, he did the requirement for the number of trains. I don't remember it in distinction, but he proved to me the number of trains. And 600,000 horses also require a hell of a lot of hay. And he told you how much hay was required for 600,000 horses. And that forgets about material and personnel. And he then said the following, that the two most significant moments for the German campaign against the Jews, the Nazi campaign against the Jews, were 1942 and 1944. What was unique about 1942 was 1942 was the year in which the Germans understood that they were not going to have an easy victory against the Soviet Union. And they should have and probably could have and must have doubled down on getting resources to the front for the long and cold winter when the German lines were stretched to their extreme. But when I teach my Holocaust course, I say the following, and it's a frightening statistic. In 1942, when the conference at Wannsee was held, four out of five Jews who were to die in the Holocaust were still alive. 15 months later, four out of five Jews were dead. So if you want to know the Holocaust, you have to know the year 1942. It's the year in which the death camps came into operation, the railroads were used. And if you want to know the war, you have to know 1942. He then went into the files of the Wehrmacht, 
and their bureaucratic battles for trains. And he saw that the chief opponent of the, of the SS was the Wehrmacht, not because it disapproved the killing of Jews, but because it needed what? Railroad cars. And why using them there, there when we need them here? Second time was 1944, and a very particular moment in 1944. On March, on March 19th, the Germans invaded Hungary. In April, they ghettoized the Jews, and from the 15th of May to the 8th of July, 437,402 Jews were deported on 147 trains, primarily to Auschwitz. There was a woman here whose mother and father came from Hungary. Her mother was in Budapest, which created a ghetto after 19, after this summer of night, in the summer of 1944, and her father was deported to Auschwitz precisely in these 54 days, 447,402 Jews, 147 trains, an average of 2.75 trains a day, 2,950 Jews per train. And by the way, if those of you who have been to Auschwitz or been to Birkenau, Notice that what they built were three tracks into the center of the camp. Why did they build three tracks? Because they needed three tracks, otherwise you can't get three trains in a day and three trains out a day. And consequently, they knew exactly what they were going to do when they built those tracks, which were only built in 1944. What was happening in the war in 1944? You all remember D-Day, June 6th, the height of the deportation. You also all remember that the Soviet Union was advancing on Germany, moving into Poland where resources were desperately needed. What do we learn from this? We learn something remarkable, which is that in a society driven by hatred, driven by a maniacal hatred that becomes absorbed, they even act dramatically against national interest. If national interest is perceived as the safety and security of the population. That tells you something about the nature and the structure of evil. And it tells you something about how overwhelming was the desire to rid the world of this population by the Germans, most particularly by Adolf Hitler, but Hitler did not operate alone. He enjoyed a lot of support. And essentially, he operated against national interest if national interest was determined by winning the war. I did an experiment with this book, which is I took the raw material out and I gave it to two people. I gave it to the man who runs the largest trucking company in the United States, who's the Child of Holocaust Survivors. And I said, give this as a raw assignment to your men who plan, and they're men, I'm not being discriminating against women here, who plan your logistical routes and see if they can deliver this stuff. And I gave it to the guy who does scheduling for United Airlines. And I said, what would you do with this problem? The one guy brought it to a staff meeting and he said the guys were screaming at each other. Presented an abstract problem. He said, don't take it, don't do it. Doesn't matter how much we get, we're gonna fall flat on our face. I don't care how much business is gonna come in from this. We can't ship this amount with these resources no matter what. And the United uh, Airlines guy said, <laughs> point being, hatred can overwhelm national interest. And that, by the way, becomes important when we consider, and I don't want to take a stance on the, on the agreement or the non-agreement with Iran, it considers something which how deep our nation's going to go even with mutually assured destruction if they really are overcome by hatred. 
Third piece of research I just want to touch on, which also shapes the world in which we live, is the largest question, and this I owe my teacher, Richard Rubenstein, is the reason I came down to Tallahassee when I started uh, trying to look at graduate schools to study the Holocaust. There are only two universities in the country that offer an advanced degree in Holocaust studies. One was Temple University in the Department of Religion, the other was FSU, and my degree is technically in, uh, history, in humanities, religion, and culture. And I came down to Tallahassee to study with a person I've never regretted. I got a hell of an interesting education here, and for a Northeasterner, it's very good to live in the uh, South, and Tallahassee and Florida is the one state where what the further south you go, the further north you are. <laughs> and this, at least, not only for radio, but culturally, is a little bit like southern Georgia. And some of you would argue a little bit more like southern Georgia <laughs> than northern Florida. Richard Rubenstein introduced the concept, and I, I say this, and some of these gentlemen here were colleagues of Richard's. Uh, he's been a, a uh, a mentor, a, a teacher, a colleague, and a friend. He introduced a very interesting concept. He introduced the fact that um, the largest issue in the world is how do we do with, deal with superfluous population, with people who have no quotation marks rightful place in society. Now, rightful place is not rights that judges use, which are a combination of natural rights legal rights, rights under the Constitution, but rights mean the ability of human beings to provide for themselves if we live in a world in which it is a natural sense of your ability to provide for yourself. And the Nazis showed us that the elimination of a population by destruction is a temptation of the state and within the capacity of the state. And the largest issue in our society that we face is how do we deal with superfluous population? It determines budgets. It determines the relationship of education versus assistance to the elderly. It determines how we deal with the poor and the orphan and the widow, the undocumented, the illegal immigrant, and all of that. The question becomes, whether your model is a covenantal model or your model is a model that speaks of the people who have the rights can express the rights. And all of the issues today that we face in our world are worlds of the question of how do we deal with superfluous population who can't fit in and who need assistance. Jews have an eerie echo to the refugees that are coming across. And when we hear some of the discussion of the refugees, some of us remember that it took until 1943 for the American government to understand that German Jewish refugees were anti-Nazi. And they then made them into a unique group that was part of the Advanced Intelligence Unit that ran the occupation, became mayors of cities, became interpreters and interrogators. And um, they, they created a special unit and the real story, not the story of Inglorious Bastards, the real story is far more interesting than Inglorious Bastards of the use that we made of German Jews who we started regarding not as anti, and not as uh, enemy aliens, but as potential for the American intelligence. I did a film on this uh, several years ago called About Face. And by the way, one of the people who was part of this advanced unit was Henry Kissinger. And uh, uh, since I'm so serious, I'll tell you a wonderful joke. We interviewed Walter Kissinger, Henry's brother, Henry's older brother. And we asked Walter Kissinger, how come you speak without an accent and Henry speaks with such, a, with such a thick accent? And he answered, have you ever noticed Henry never listens? <laughs> 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 the 
true story. <laughs> but you won't believe it. Henry Kissinger, uh, it, it's, it, it's a cute story. Henry Kissinger was, in the, was on, D, uh, on um, KP duty, cleaning a toilet with a toothbrush. A general comes in and he's going to the head, to the bathroom, and he's saying, who the hell can read this? He used the number of words I won't use in polite company. Maybe not all of you are, maybe some of you are polite. I won't use them in, in polite company. He said, who the hell can read this map? Kissinger gets up off the floor and he says, I can read the map. Nine guys have guns out, pointed at his head. He's speaking with a German accent. He interprets the map and the general says, what are you doing? He says, I'm KP duty for two weeks. He said, after you finish with KP duty, go to your commanding officer, he'll have you transferred to my unit. And you realize that a guy with the skill of Henry Kissinger, linguistic skill of Henry Kissinger, is taken off the floor and brought into a general staff meeting and he then became the mayor of a city under occupation. But the largest point is that the issues raised by the Holocaust, the issues raised by the Holocaust are central issues in our day and in our time, and I wish they were not. Last point, and on this I'm gonna leave you on a little bit, two, last two points on this, I'll leave you with a little bit of optimism. Don't believe anybody who tells you regarding the Jewish condition that this is 1933, 38, or 42. And don't believe that because we tell you it's not the Holocaust that anti-Semitism isn't a real issue in our society. But don't believe for a moment that we have a repetition of what occurred. We don't have a repetition in the United States and we have a dramatic non-repetition in Europe, and we have an equally dramatic non-repetition for different reasons even in the Islam world. Let me just cover it in 10 seconds. You're gonna laugh. Judaism is the most popular religion in America, which means it's the least unpopular religion in America. Demographics are very interesting because essentially the Roman Catholic Church is going through a double shock. The first shock was the loss of credibility with regard to the sex scandals and the role of the bishops in covering it up, which has shaken the pews dramatically. And the second shock is that it's undergoing an inner turmoil by a creative, innovative, um, progressive pope against the bureaucracy that was installed by two very conservative Roman Catholic prelates. And therefore, the struggle in Roman Catholicism and against Roman Catholicism is significant in the United States. I'll give you one other statistic. Roman Catholics have abortions in the same percentage of general population. They use contraception in the same percentage of general population. They get divorced in the same percentage of the general population. Therefore, they're no better than the Jews. They're not listening to that clergy people either, with all due apologies to the rabbi. <laughs> Protestantism is divided between evangelicals and liberals, and um, uh, nobody is particularly fond of the Muslims today because they fear that behind every Muslim is a potential terrorist. Therefore, Judaism becomes the least unpopular of the religions, the most popular. And that's, I'm not sure how long that will last, but I can only say for those of us who are Jewish, enjoy it while it lasts, Jewish history. <laughs> Jewish history would say it's not gonna last for a long time. What's the difference in Europe between the events? You have a very interesting phenomenon, which is that European leaders are proclaiming loudly and clearly that the Jews are a part of Europe. President of France, in the aftermath of what happened in France, said the following. President and the Prime Minister said, France without its Jews is not France. Now imagine 70 years ago, something like that being said. And therefore, he laid claim to these people as Frenchmen 
This in a society where Theodor Herzl found Zion, founded Zionism because he heard during the Dreyfus trials what death to the Jews, because Dreyfus was not a Frenchman, couldn't be a Frenchman, he was Jewish. The other element that is, and the same thing can be said if I take you country through country, and again, if you go even to countries that were traditionally anti-Semitic, and you take a look at Poland, you can go to a synagogue in Poland more readily than you can go to a synagogue in New York. The doors are open, no security out front. The institutions do not face any scrutiny. They feel safe. What's the other issue? And Europe has massive problems, including the question of the uh, refugees and the undocumented and the migrants, uh, the, the, the Muslim populations and the migrants. The interesting thing is that the extreme right, which is anti-immigrant, cannot join forces with the left, which may be anti-Israel. So because of that, you cannot have a cross-the-board coalition. You have a strong enough division there that they can't move in the same direction. And consequently, Jews are uniquely situated where both sides are a little bit self-restrained. That doesn't mean there are not extreme right-wing movements. The Golden Dawn Party, Yabas, doesn't mean that they're not extreme leftists who are viciously anti-Israel. It means that they can't join forces and Jews stand in a particularly protected area. In the Muslim world, what the largest phenomenon is, everything Christianity has gotten rid of has been imported to the Muslim world. Charge of blood libel, the protocols of the elders of Zion, all of that has been imported into the Muslim world even though it was a creation of Europe and alien to Islam. Added to that is the political idea that Jews occupy land that was once Islam and that is sacred to Islam and you have a major battle. But even there, there is a tension because Israel today has a strategic alliance with several Arab countries. And if it's wise enough, the strategic alliance will transform itself into a political gains. And if it's unwise, they will alienate the strategic alliance so that people will hate Israel more than they're interested in their own well-being. And that's a great danger. Let me conclude then with coming back to us. We have done something in this generation that is profoundly historic, and you are part of it, an integral part of it. We have made, Jews once made, a particular story that happened to a particular people, the universal symbol of the struggle for freedom within large context of the world. Everybody in the world or everybody in the worlds that we know understands the words Egypt and Pharaoh's slavery, the struggle to go across the sea and to come into the desert, and the dream of a promised land. It's not only the Negro spiritual that can say, go down Moses, way down to Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. What has this generation accomplished, most especially the survivors? We have taken the story of the Holocaust and used that to enlarge the domain of human responsibility, to deepen the concept of human morality, to mean that we are responsible not only for people here and now within our vicinity, but for what happens in our world, to plead for human dignity and to argue for human decency. I wish we lived in a world in which we didn't have to do that because it was natural and assumed, but we live in a world in which that message is more urgent today than it was even in the immediate years after the Holocaust. Therefore, thank you for what you're doing. You should feel good about it. You should do more. And we should understand that we have to transform this world so we bequeath a better world to our children. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Do you mind if anybody has any questions? Okay. <laughs> Is there any anybody have any questions for Michael? Byron? Come on, come on up here. I wonder how you view the uh, migration. Let's let me go back to the larger issue even before yeah, how do I feel about the issue of refugees in the world today, especially coming from Muslim countries, when him among them may be a fifth column? Uh, let me tell you what the largest issue in Europe is, and I lectured on this earlier, uh, I think it was yesterday. There is a difference, and let me use France as an example only because I really know that best. There is anti-Semitism in France and there is anti-Semitism of France. <coughs> the French Muslim community which is living in France is not French. They don't assimilate and therefore they don't absorb the values of that country. If you absorb the values of liberty, equality and fraternity, then you have no problem accepting Jews and accepting Muslims and accepting Catholics and accepting ardent secularists as part of your universe. But if you are responsive not to events in your country but elsewhere and not assimilating values and don't see yourself as part of that, then in a very deep way you have a dangerous population that triggers and responds to events in the Middle East by attacking the Jews next door. That's only going to be exacerbated by refugees, except for two things. The first thing in the refugee situation is there will be a large enough and significant enough population that's going to be so grateful for getting out of that situation, and also who have essentially middle class values, because the people who are leaving are leaving to protect their children and themselves and their wives that they will ironically be an ardent move toward assimilation in the countries in which they live. France has done a lousy job of assimilation. Germany has a Turkish population that's lived in Germany for two and three generations but still don't see themselves as Germans. And Turkish, uh, Germany ironically is importing Jews, including Israelis and Russians, because we're white. So you want an irony of history, the largest growing Jewish community in Europe is now Germany, which welcomes the Jews not because it particularly likes the Jews, but because of the color of our skin and the skills that are brought with it. And you now have the Israelis whose grandparents escaped the Holocaust going back and reclaiming European citizenship. And Europe itself is undergoing an interesting turmoil and I'll give it to you in, a, in an interesting conversation. I sat last summer with a colleague of mine who's a very close friend of Paul. I sat in his home. He said, my family has lived in this home for 450 years. And I was saying, it's a good thing they dusted. <laughs> he said, but my kids are not going to live in this home. I have one kid in Britain, I have one kid in Germany, I have one kid in Spain. What's going to happen to our Polish tradition? Meaning that, that part of what we have in the United States, which we have to understand, is David's from Oklahoma City. His wife's from Norfolk, Virginia. They don't think anything about moving to what? Tallahassee. We all come from elsewhere. I'm from New York, I live in Los Angeles. The question then becomes, where are you from and where are you and what are you doing? But there are different languages, different, different nationalities. We, by the way, um, the genius of America with regard to refugees has always been that not only refugees but also uh, immigrants has been that we've assimilated them. And the first generation is grateful for being in America the second generation regard themselves as Americans, and the third generation tries to remember what the second generation tried to forget. Now, last figure, uh, I just had a letter in the Los Angeles Times 
where two guys were debating whether 2.5% or 3.8% of the refugees were going to be ISIS transplants. And I said, I'm an empiricist. I want to know on what basis they have this information. And until they show me the information, I don't know if it's 50% or 80%, but you can't tell me that one guy knows it's 2.5%, another guy knows it's 3.8%. How? How? Now, last point, which is a little bit of a non-thing. Remember that one of the reasons we didn't take Jews in the 1930s was we were convinced that the Nazis would put fifth column in that, and we regarded Jews who came over as enemy aliens. And some of you are even descendants of people who were regarded with deep suspicion because they were thought to be pro-Nazi. And by the way, we didn't, in, even in Iraq, we didn't learn the lesson that we had learned in the war in Germany, which is we didn't make significant use of the Iraqi expats who were anti-Iraq, anti-Saddam, but who had the linguistic skill. You had a thousand people in the embassy, only one of whom spoke Arabic. I mean, this, you know, you want to talk about State Department responsibility, ask a question, how do you have a thousand people in an embassy, one of whom speaks the language? And I live in the largest uh, Persian community that is in Los Angeles that is Farsi speaking. And I had to argue with a friend of mine who later, who became head of personnel for the CIA in the revamping. You want native Farsi speakings, I'll give you native Farsi speakers, I'll give you native Farsi speakers. Why don't you have an office that recruits in Los Angeles so that you can begin to what? Why are you looking for Farsi speakings when you have all these people all of whom hate the Ayatollah more than you do, who speak the language, and you make use of the refugees in order to accomplish a goal. The refugee situation in Europe is terrible. It is a result of letting a bad problem fester. It's a result of not having bombed Syria when it violated the thing. And if you ask me, if you say that if the President of the United States ever says that a foreign leader must leave office, he had better make good on that promise. And I say that as an ardent Democrat who, you know, uh, uh, was uh, disappointed that we didn't respond when a red line has been drawn. Either don't draw a red line, either don't call for, for um, uh, Assad's removal, or deliver on it, otherwise you weaken us all. Any other questions? Yes? You say engineering, and if they had supplied the resources from the Holocaust to the war effort, how long would the war have lasted? Well, it would have lasted longer because they would have been more fierce in their they would have been more fierce in their opposition. They would have had the resources to do it. But remember, Germany was held up on the edge of Moscow. They were 20 some odd miles from Moscow. They were held up on, on Stalingrad and they had the opportunity to enter these societies. They didn't provide winter clothes for their soldiers. They didn't provide them the type of things and, and in essence, the argument that could have been used, which uh, the author did not exactly make, was that as an American, and as uh, a man who wanted to see the defeat of Nazism, we should have been grateful that Hitler got sidetracked in killing the Jews instead of devoting all his energies to winning the war. He didn't quite go there, and I wouldn't quite go there, but let me tell you that you don't use your major res you don't misallocate the major resources. When you're in war, you allocate them appropriately, especially if it's a war in which your national survival I, I, your, your national survival depends on the outcome of the war. And the thousand year Reich lasted 12 years and the national survival depended on that victory. Thankfully, it, they lost. Any other questions? Uh, yes.
Yeah, that, you made an interesting point. You said a third of the uh, effort that funded the war um, effort was taken from the Jews. Uh, I don't know if it's a third, a quarter, 10%, 20%, but let me give you, an, and many of you here work for government, and all of you live in the vicinity of government. The murder of the Jews had no budget. It had to be self-financing. The reason that they confiscated the wealth of the Jews is because they needed that wealth in order to finance their own destruction. And by the way, many Jews were very poor, but if you take the totality of what people have and you're eliminating all of that, the idea that you could undertake so massive an undertaking without a budget is really astounding, but there were no budget items. Now, lest you think that that's, uh, let me explain something to you. A small detail, and somebody should do the calculation, but let me give you the figure. German corporations invested 700 million Rax marks in 1942 in the industries around Auschwitz. Now, you know enough that a 700 million Rax marks investment in 1942, which is at least tens of billions of dollars today, is meant not for one year or two years or three years, it's a capital investment, meant for many years. But it also means that the SS contemplated that they were gonna lease their slave labor to the industries, get paid for the slave labor, and be able to support their other activities on the basis of leasing out people who were being paid, not being, paid at all who were being contained, barely fed, no medical treatment, and were used and sent to die. So those of you who work with government bureaucracies, imagine an entire arm of government this large. Three million killed. At some point, there were um, uh, millions in camps themselves, and uh, 11 million people who were slave laborers without a budget item. And once you understand that, you understand the way in which they confiscated. Look, and this was done, and this is where I'm gonna take one issue, and I wanna explain it to you. People who tell you that education is the antithesis of hatred really mean to add one more word, a good education that's based on values. 15 men who decided at Vonsay Conference, who were at Vonsay, eight had doctorates. Eight had doctorates. They were what we call in our Vietnam parlance the best and the brightest. Germany was the most highly educated society in the world, the most advanced culture, science, music, literature, art, philosophy. These were educated monsters. So it's not only education, but it's the values that underscore education and the human values and commitment to human values that underscore education. That's why when you work on pluralism, on tolerance, on decency, on dignity, that's when you're really doing a very important part of education because I don't believe in values-free education. I believe in education that communicates deep values and I'm a great believer in the fundamental values that underscore the American enterprise. I think we have had a, at our core, with all our failings, we have some very critical values that we should be proud of and that they're underscored in our constitutional world. Thank you very much. Thank you.